Okay, so in part one of the this lecture on defects in crystals and focusing on point defects, in part one we talked about vacancies, and I want to talk about the other two types of point defects, um, uh, uh, interstitials and substitutionals in this lecture. So let's go ahead and first talk about interstitial defects. An interstitial defect uh, is an extra atom that's inserted in between the atoms in a lattice, and it causes lattice distortion like vacancies. And we typically break um, interstitial defects into two types. The first type is what's called a self-interstitial, um, and it's where there's an interstitial atom of the same type as what's in the lattice. So what you can see in this picture is if these are all, all these blue atoms are the same type of atom, and we've now inserted the same atom into in between the lattice and we've sort of forced the other atoms out and you can see how the lattice planes distort. The other uh, type of interstitial is called an interstitial impurity uh, and in this case the interstitial atom will be different than the other, lat uh, other atoms in the lattice and so what you can see is uh, in this case is uh, these gray atoms make up the lattice, these orange atoms are residing as interstitials in the lattice. So where do they reside? Well, usually we, at least in the case of BCC and FCC, we characterize the sites that are available for the interstitial atoms to reside as either octahedral or tetrahedral. And so what I'm showing you here is, is a BCC structure. So BCC, here's your corner atoms on the cube, right? there with the center atom and then this is a center atom in a subsequent cell below it and then in the FCC case here's your four corner atoms uh, on the top and your four corner atoms on the bottom and then you have your atoms on the faces right so there's basically two types octahedral and tetrahedral and why do we call it octahedral because the atom resides at the center of an octahedron right so there this is it's shaded in the FCC case, but you can still see it in the BCC. It's basically this this uh, eight-sided um, structure, and the atom resides in the center. Uh, in the case of a, a tetrahedral structure, it's it resides at the center of a a four-atom, or sorry, a four-sided uh, shape, right? So there's three triangles there, and then a triangle at the bottom to make four. Atom resides at the center, okay? So where do you see something like this? To make steel, we have to add uh, carbon to iron, and that carbon resides at the octahedral location in the BCC lattice of iron. Okay? How about substitutional defects? So if interstitials were uh, uh, atoms that were inside the lattice, a substitutional occurs when some atom in the lattice is swapped out with a different type of atom. So it's very easy to, to visualize. You can imagine that this structure is all regular. These gray atoms make up our lattice. And then we, we now insert a different kind of atom, this peach colored atom, and that would be a substitutional defect. So in that case, all substitutional atoms are impurity atoms because they're a different type, okay? So this leads us uh, sort of naturally to a discussion of alloys. So an alloy, all it is is a metal that we've added impurity atoms to, so because we want to create some set of properties. Most commonly, we're trying to increase the strength or the corrosion resistance. So when we add impurity atoms to, to a metal, it can result in one of two things. One is it can create a second phase uh, in the material. We haven't talked about phases yet, but we're going to later in class. So I'm just going to leave that be for right now. The other, uh, the other um, uh, state that it could could um, result in is what's called a solid solution. And all that is is where the impurities are going to be incorporated via interstitial defects or substitutional defects. So I can give you some examples. One I already did. One was that interstitial alloy is how we make steel, right? We put carbon atoms at an interstitial location in BCC iron to make steel. But the, a substitutional alloy, maybe, maybe you are, maybe you aren't aware of this, but uh, obviously in aircraft, there's a strong desire to reduce um, weight, uh, right? Because we get uh, better fuel efficiency uh, by not having to fly as heavy of planes. So one uh, common substitutional alloy uh, that, that's been developed for this is an aluminum lithium alloy. 
and it's designed to reduce uh, aircraft weight. Why? Because lithium is the lightest metallic element. So if you take aluminum, which is reasonably light, but you now swap out some of the atoms with lithium, uh, then you can make an even lighter uh, metal. And so that's that's been the focus of a lot of aluminum producers for, for um, quite a while now. And, and I think they can get down to maybe a reduction of a uh, weight of maybe 10% by by uh, using an aluminum lithium alloy. So what I'm showing you here is a just a schematic of an Airbus A380. And it, this is kind of showing you different kinds of materials that go into different uh, pieces uh, of the plane. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of them, but I wanted to highlight if you the, these, these box region, those are where they're putting aluminum lithium alloys. And primarily that's for weight reduction in the plane. So they're, they're sort of a competing um, technology to um, uh, carbon fiber uh, materials uh, for, for light weighting on aircraft. Okay, So those are two examples of uh, one example of an inter interstitial, which is just steel, which I don't need to show you a picture of, and then the other being aluminum lithium alloy. There's lots of other types uh, like this. Okay, so how now do we want to talk about solid solution? So if we're going to add um, an, an impurity element into a, a material, we need to start defining some terms. So we're going to define the solvent as the, whatever element is present in the greatest amount. So in the example of our aluminum lithium alloys, aluminum would be the solvent. Um, in the case of our carbon iron al alloys, i.e. steel, then um, iron would be our solvent. And the solute is going to be the element that's present in a minor concentration. Okay, we're going to need to find a way to label um, the the makeup of this solution, and so we introduce the idea of composition uh, or concentration. They're synonyms, uh, and so we want to know how much percent of the solvent or solute is is going to be in there, and we report that as either a atomic percent. Right? How, what's the percentage of uh, atoms versus a weight percent? Okay. So in the case of an atomic percent, we're going to denote that your book. I'm just following your book. Your book denotes it with an apostrophe by the by the concentration or the composition. And I'm just I'm super uh, subscripting this atom one just for uh, this time, just so you can kind of see what's happening. So this is the atomic concentration of atom one uh, in the solid solution. And so we're just going to so there, there's your definition. All it is is the number of moles of element one divided by the sum of the moles of element one plus the moles of element two, of course, times 100 to get a percentage. Pretty easy. Weight percentage is very similar, except instead of uh, the number of moles, now we have the mass. So there's our composition measured in weight percentage. Here's of element one. You'll notice when we're talking about weight percents, I'm just following your book notation. There is no apostrophe um, on that on that uh, composition. And all that, all we need to, to find that is the mass of element one divided by the, the sum of the masses, right? So we have the M1 is the mass of element one, M2 is the mass of element two. Of course, one thing you should always know if, we're, if we had the three element system, for example, we could derive something similar. The main thing that we need to remember is that the compositions must all sum to to 100%, uh, right? So in a, in a, in a two, component system, then C1 plus C2 uh, must be 100%, right? Sometimes, though, it's it's convenient to uh, convert from one form to the other, from the, from the atomic percent to the weight percent and vice versa. And we can do that easily just by remembering the relationship between mass and moles, right? So we have the number of moles of one is equal to the mass of a one in grams, remember, divided by A1, which is just the atomic weight. So if you use that, you can go through and you can develop all sorts of uh, relationships. Your book gives you a bunch of them. I'm not going to give them all to you here. I'll just give you um, a three conversions. Um, and the first is how do we go from weight percent to atomic percent? And and so you can just see this, this formula. The composition in um, atomic percent of... Uh, Element or uh, of element one is given by this equation, composition of element two and atomic percent given by this equation, where the C1 and C2 values are the weight percent values, right? And we can go back the other way, uh, in, right? And so now this is the weight percent, and here's the C1 prime is the, the, the atomic percent of element one, right? 
And then sometimes it's convenient to convert weight percent to a mass per unit volume of each constituent. And so following your book, I, I, I denote that as a double prime. And these are the equations that, that uh, give you that, right? So you just need to take the, the uh, weight percent of the, of the uh, element one, for example, uh, divided by the, the weight percent of one divided by the density of one plus the weight percent of two divided by the density of two. And that gives you the um, mass per unit volume of, of element one. And, it, and it's going to be in the, whatever units you gave the density in. Okay. So that it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, if, if you run across problems in your homework that you need additional um, uh, 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 relationships for, uh, they should be in your textbooks. You can just look those up. Um, but that's that sort of ties up all that we want to say about point defects right now. And I guess I want to leave you with a question at the end that will lead us to our next uh, uh, topic, which will be uh, line defects or dislocations. Right now, in class, you you understand uh, the that a material is created, a crystalline material at least, has this lattice structure where atoms are located at very specific points on the lattice. Um, now you know a little bit about defects. Um, what, one of my questions that I want to pose is, how do we deform a metal? So I think I could I think I could understand how we could fracture a metal, right? I could break all the bonds. Um, and I think I understand how we could could stretch a metal elastically by stretching those bonds. But how do we plastically deform a material where if we bend a piece of metal, it stays bent but doesn't break? So that's the question I want to leave you with. And the answer is going to be um, sort of an integral part of why we're going to talk about these linear defects called dislocations uh, in, in the next lecture.